everybody, we are back with this series on the foundations of deception. And uh, in this fourth presentation, we want to deal with what we are calling today the messengers of darkness. That's what we're going to deal with. In the last presentation, we dealt primarily with the kingdom of darkness and we, we did declare that there is an agenda that agenda is being prosecuted with agency, military discipline, and uh, we did say that there is a pattern uh, to the madness that we see around us. Today we are concerned with the messengers of darkness. That is a message we want to deal with in this presentation. And to start us off, I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 7, I want us to read verse 15 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to verse 16. Those couple of verses will kick us off in this presentation. Messengers of darkness, the emissaries of darkness <clears throat> is what we are concerned with. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he speaks to his disciples and uh, he warns them. He says the following words. He says, watch out for false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Then verse 16, the Lord says, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Of course, that's a rhetoric question whose answer is no. They don't. So those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want us to look also at the words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, the Apostle weighs in with the following words. He says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Then verse 2, many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Verse 3, in their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories, their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been slipping. Now, in the first lecture, in the first presentation, our first message, we dealt with the certainty of the coming of the false prophets and the false teachers of apostasy, of deception, in what we call biblical prophecy. In the second message, we dealt then with, uh, sorry, that was the second message. The third message, we dealt with the kingdom of darkness because you remember in the first message, we introduced this message to you. Then in the first, we talked about the certainty, the promise of biblical prophecy. Then in the second message, we, so, sorry, the third message, we dealt then with <clears throat> the kingdom of darkness and the agenda that it has for the souls of men, for the church of Jesus Christ, and for the advance of the gospel. Today, then, we want to deal with the messengers of darkness. Now, despite Scripture being unequivocal, being very clear on false prophets and messengers of darkness, and fortunately, there are many among us who in the name of charity and the name of brotherly unity forbid us not to call them out. They, they insist that we are divisive 
in the way that we talk, that we could have uh, a little bit more of love, we could uh, put on some velvet gloves in the way that we deal with these people and these subjects. What I'm going to say to such postulations, to such accusations, yes, to such exhortations, is that they don't understand the seriousness of what you're dealing with. They don't understand. I tell you, my friends, what is at stake is the souls, the eternal souls of men. That is what is at stake. I was reading the layman's commentary on Galatians chapter 2, where Paul is calling out Peter for duplicity and for hypocrisy in the face of the Jewish brethren, finding him lodging and dining with the Gentile people. And Paul uh, went uh, hammer and tongs, if you will, at Peter. Now this commentary was saying that it is a fine thing for the servant of the Lord to recognize when weighty matters are at stake. When in fact, the very gospel, the very saving gospel of Christ is in jeopardy, the commentary goes on to say, that's a commentary on Galatians chapter 2, that at that very moment, compromise is not possible for the Christian person, for the minister of the gospel. I add that at that time, prevarication and equivocation is not possible for us. And this is what we are saying, that what is at stake are the very souls of men, and therefore we cannot prevaricate, we cannot be seen to be ambiguous in the way that we deal with these things. But secondly, other than just the souls of men being at stake, I think if you read the adjectives which Scripture attaches to false teachers and false teaching, those adjectives, those labels which scripture attaches to false teachers and false teaching, you begin to understand that the very text of scripture treats of this matter very seriously. Far more seriously than we treat of the matter. Scripture refers to false teachers and their false teaching as wolves. Scripture talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, in the language of Paul, for example, he talks about ravenous wolves. In the language, say, of Peter and John, these false teachers are called antichrists. These are weighty appellations, my friends. The Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8, verse 44, dealing with the naysayers of his day in the persons of Jews, the Pharisees in particular, the false teachers of the day of his day. He referred to them as children of Satan. Now you begin to see that in the language of scripture, false teachers are not to be treated lightly. They are not to be treated with velvet gloves. Now, before, in the previous messages, we have referred to texts uh, such as um, Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, where the scripture, Paul speaking to the Romans, he says, mark those who cause division contrary to doctrine and do what? Avoid them, says the apostle. So false teachers and their teaching is not a light matter in scripture. Now, here's the point. How would you treat of a wolf, for example, who happens to be in a thicket? You can see that wolf. It's disguised in the thicket. It's hidden in the thicket. And there are people that are actually walking towards the wolf. Would you use wisdom in warning them? Would you use velvet gloves? Would you be a lot more smarter? Would you approach the matter, you know, in, in the way that we, you know, you will shout, you will warn, because a wolf is not an animal to joke with. This is how scripture looks at false teaching and false teachers. We must call them out. We must call them out. We must. Now then, I want to say something here in a manner of, uh, making a distinction which I think is very, very important. When we talk about false teachers and false teaching, 
in my mind, in my view, it falls in two broad categories. False teachers can be classified in two classifications. Classification number one are the false teachers whom we can say or we can term the unwitting false teachers. Those who are false teachers without their knowledge, they don't know that they are false teachers. I grant my friends that there are many among us who have themselves been deceived, who have been themselves been steeped into her error and deception, and they know no better. I know friends of mine who would defend error to the death. I mean, because they are so convinced that what they believe is the truth, that what they believe is right. There are people like that. And to these people, we must continue to pray. We must hope that the Lord will recover them. That's why Paul says, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 to 26, he says, the servant of the Lord, we who know the truth must not be quarrelsome, but we must be gentle with humility, with patience and with wisdom, instructing those who have been taken into the captive of the enemy. They have been ensnared. Peradventure, Paul says, they must recover their senses and be redeemed from that kind of morass. So there are people who have taken a teaching and are running with the teaching. A majority of people in Africa, for example, I know for a fact, they watch television and see T.D. Jacks and see Joyce Meyer and see Kenneth Copeland and see uh, Benny Hinn and see Joseph Prince and see all these false teachers who parade their wares on television. And because somehow in Africa people believe that the Americans know better, that in fact what they teach is biblical truth. They take it and because there is little discernment, they take it home to their people. These are false teachers who are unwitting. They don't know. Some of us were raised in false teaching for many years. That's all we knew. We never knew an alternative. We were never taught to read the Bible. We were never taught to discern scripture. We were never taught to ask questions. So that's what we grew up with. There are false teachers like that and false teaching like that. Then there's a second category of false teachers, dear friends. And this second category is fully conscious that they are in fact twisting scripture. Paul refers to this category, for example, uh, so not Paul actually, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, I believe, and verse 15 and 16. Um, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, Peter speaks like this about this category of false teachers. He says, verse 15, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with wisdom that God gave him. He writes in the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters, his lay in these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, when Peter talks about ignorant and unstable, he talks about studious ignorance. People who have chosen to be ignorant. They have chosen to be, to, 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 to sort of believe the lie, you know. Uh, Paul speaks about these people, for example, in Romans chapter 1. And verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed against all the children of disobedience. Who do what, says Paul? Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. The literal Greek has the implication here more or less the same like you would have a spring. You know, a spring coils when you press it, but when you release the pressure, it comes right back up. And what Paul has in mind is that truth is like that. You can press it in the manner of suppressing. It will shrink, but it doesn't disappear. It comes back up in their conscience, and they suppress it again. So what you have there is studious ignorance, willful 
ignorance. There are people like that. Paul speaks of them, for example, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and verses 28 and 29, particularly, I think, in verse 29, where Paul says, After my departure, savage wolves would come, and they will draw away disciples after themselves with damnable heresies. They will draw people. They are willingly engaging in that type of activity. We have those two, and by the way, we could go on and on and on to list the text in which such people are referred to. But the point is made then, there are two categories of false teachers. Now you ask me, why have you mentioned them? Why have you differentiated them? Two things I will say. Number one, it is to tell you that both categories are absolutely dangerous. None of them is safe. Sincere ignorance is still ignorance. Unwitting heresy is still heresy. If someone goes ahead to teach other people something that is wrong, that will damn their souls, it will not matter whether they meant it or they did not mean it. It will not matter whether they were honest in it or they were not honest in it. It won't matter whether they were sincere or not sincere. It won't matter whether they knew what they're doing or whether they didn't know what they're doing. This is what Jesus says, for example, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. He says, leave them alone. Matthew 15, 14. It says, leave them alone, for they are blind men leading the blind. And what will happen? They will both fall into a ditch, regardless that they are both blind. The consequence is the same. But the second reason why I made that distinction was to bring home the point that there are men for whom we must pray and by the grace of God reach out with the gospel of truth because they don't know better. And this is why this broadcast is coming to you. You might be one of those people who have been in false teaching and I encourage you to follow this broadcast, to follow these presentations. Perhaps you might know whether you've been in false teaching unknowingly. The Lord might rescue you through these presentations, through this channel. So please subscribe to this channel by, uh, by clicking the subscribe button that appears at the right-hand corner of your screen. Please subscribe so that we can bring you notifications and you can also log on to our website www.reformedgospel.org All one word, www.reformedgospel.org .org. There will be excellent material for you there, video presentations, articles, book reviews, uh, pamphlets and, and, and tracts for evangelism, uh, things that are going to help you to grow in your faith and to have better discernment around your life and around your ministry. So we encourage you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, but we also ask you to log on to our website, www. Uh, .reformedgospel.org all one word www.reformedgospel.org so there are people that we must reach with the gospel of truth and they are in that category now in the Matthew account that we read in chapter 7 the Lord proceeds to say that we shall know these false prophets by their fruit he says, we'll be able to know them. Some people are telling us, how can you speak so confidently? How can you be a judge of another person? Because the Lord says, we will know them by their fruit. There are some exhibitions that they will make. There are some traits that we'll see in their lives. And those traits will make us to identify them. And Paul told us, mark them. So we have a duty to mark the false prophet to mark out the false teacher, to identify the false teacher, and then to avoid them and to help God's people to avoid them. So we are not being unloving. We are not being mean-spirited here. We are serving the Lord and we are serving God's people. And part of that then involves getting the alarm bell. This is what Ezekiel says. He says, we've set you as a watchman over the city. If you see the sword coming upon the city and you don't raise an alarm, the blood of those people will be required from your hands. 
We want no blood in our hands, dear people. We want to serve the Lord. So how shall we know them? There will be marks that identify the false prophet, the false teacher, especially the incorrigible type. Those that have made a trade, as Peter told us, that they will make merchandise. They will make business out of God's people. They will fly with jets. They will live in mansions. They will do wonderful things and get wonderful lives for themselves at the expense of God's people. How shall you know them? How shall you know that this is a false teacher? What are those telltale signs that should awaken you? And I will give you seven of them very quickly. That will help you to discern that you're in a wrong place, in the wrong presence. You are not at the right place. You're not hearing the right teaching, not at least from the right person. So what are those marks? Number one, and I said this in my previous messages throughout this series. When you see them insisting on signs and wonders... When you see them insisting on signs and wonders, miracles, explosions, experiences, your antenna needs to be raised up. Now, in the fracas of things, the false teacher will run away with the soul of the people. He creates chaos and confusion by the many experiences, people falling over themselves, other people being slain in the spirit, somebody claiming to have received a miracle here and there. What they are doing is they are mudding the environment. Be watchful. You can read that, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 4, and perhaps I should read that one. Watch out for that person who emphasizes experience, who emphasizes miracles, who advertises signs and wonders. That is a danger sign. You need to be aware that at that place there might be something going on under the radar. Something might be afoot uh, for your soul. Deuteronomy 13 Verses 1 to verse 4. If a prophet says a scripture, or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or a wonder, verse 2, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, mark you, and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, Gods you have not known, and let us worship them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. Dear friends, if a prophet comes to you, or a dreamer of dreams, and dreams a dream, or prophesies a vision, or performs a sign, or a wonder. The text is telling us that that doesn't matter. That doesn't validate the prophet. Sadly, today, we have made signs and wonders a validation of the prophet, a validation of the preacher. He says, even if he should perform the signs and wonders, and then his overall tenor, the thrust of his ministry draws you away from the Lord, from the truth of Scripture, from the veracity of the authenticity of saving faith, of the authenticity of the Christian faith. Don't follow that man, even if he saw the miracle. Again, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. He says, in those days, many Christs will come, many false prophets will come, and they will be given power to even call fire from heaven. Signs and wonders is the hubri. It is the chaos in which the false prophet works out his deception. The world's greatest magician, his name was Houdini. He had a principle, and he said, misdirection. Get the people engaged in the wrong thing as you deceive their minds. 
That's what pro pro false prophets do. They engage your mind. They engage your attention in something different. While they run away with your mind. Remember, in Deuteronomy 13, we are told if such a thing happens, that a false prophet performs a sign and a wonder, or dreams a dream, or prophesies a vision, and it comes true, yet it doesn't lead you to the Lord, perhaps it leads you to the man himself, or perhaps it leads you to something else. What is happening, says Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 to verse 4, the Lord himself is testing you. Whether you love him and truly obey him, can you be swayed by signs and wonders? Can you be swayed by miracles? The Lord himself is testing you. And that's what we find, and we've read, read this text in our previous messages. We've read this text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Fox. Again, we return to that verse because as I told you in our earlier messages, it's a very, very scary text. One that we do well to pay attention to every other day that we come across it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with our certain works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. So there is signs and wonders which serve the lie. They don't serve the truth. They serve the lie. They are there to deceive you. They are there to misdirect you, as Mr. Houdini said. Verse 10. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Why are they perishing, says Paul? Because they refused to love the truth and to be saved. Verse 11 is scary, dear folks. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. God sends a strong delusion so that they will believe a lie. Because once you want to go your own way and you're obstinate, the Lord will give you that which you want. He will let you have it. That's what happens to King, I think it was King Ahab. When he wanted people to tell him nice things. He wanted to be told what he wants to hear. God sent a lying spirit so that he can believe a lie. You see, that's the same thing that happens when Paul says that in the latter days, some will heap for themselves teachers who will tell them what their itchy ears want to hear. They will gather around themselves. We are in that generation. So signs and wonders. Watch out for those. But then, the second thing will be prophecies that don't come to pass. This is a second mark of a false prophet. Prophecies that don't come to pass. Now, I, I say this because I think it has been proven time and again that these so-called prophets that run around our land these days have been proven to give prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that doesn't come to pass, yet we still believe them. It's amazing. William Marion Branham, that old prophet in the 60s and I think early 70s, prophesied the coming back of Jesus, the second return of Jesus, three times. We know William Marion Branham is dead. The Lord Jesus has not returned. Yet there are such a people in this world called Branhamites who still believe the doctrine of William Marion Branham. Somebody called Robert Sladen wrote a book called God's Book of Generals and there he lists William Marion Branham as one of God's generals. How ignorant, how naive, how gullible can we be? Yes, scripture says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, from verse 20 to verse 22, that if a prophet, in fact, gives a prophecy that turns out not to have come true, that prophet cannot be of the Lord. He cannot be of the Lord. He is to be shunned. He is, in fact, to be stoned until he dies. That's what 
they, uh, they did to them in those days. They didn't give them offering. They stoned them until they died. If you made a prophecy in the name of the Lord and that prophecy never came to pass, you were stoned to death because they took those matters rather very, very seriously. Deuteronomy 18, verse 20 to 22. The text says to us, But a prophet who presumes, a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death, is to be killed, not to be given an offering, not to be understood, not to be, you know, people say, let's understand that they made a mistake. You don't make a mistake in the name of God. Make a mistake in the name of any other. Scripture says do not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. This whole idea of the Lord told me. Don't use the name of the Lord your God in vain. He says that prophet must be stoned to death. You may say to yourselves, verse 21, you may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Verse 22. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. That prophet, prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. Friends, how many times has men, have men like Benihim been caught flat-footed with false prophecies. In fact, one time when Benihin was caught with a false prophecy that didn't come to pass, he said something rather mysterious, something so unbiblical. This is the defense he made. He said, we still make mistakes, but there's a time that the prophecy will be perfected. You see, scripture doesn't give room for mistakes when you're speaking in the name of the Lord. And that is why Paul tells Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, even in ordinary preaching of the word of God, Paul tells Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. It is important that you get correctly that which you're communicating to the people in the name of the Lord. The prophet who prophesies those prophecies that don't come true is worthy of death, not worthy of understanding. So it is time for us to wake up from our slumber, people, and we must begin to judge these people the way Scripture judges them. If he says something that does not come true, that prophet is a lie. The so-called Nigerian prophet, T.B. Joshua, recently talked of a woman being president of the United States of America. Obviously, he referred to uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton. That didn't come true. Donald Trump, we know, is the president of the United States of America. What do we make of that? People in churchland, people within Christianity, are very quick to dismiss that and to cut him some slack, to give him latitude. Well, Scripture says, such a man is worthy of death. And in the language, by the way, of 2 Peter chapter 2, Scripture says, of course, we are not going to stone them today. We are not in the Old Testament. We are not going to stone them. But Scripture says their destruction is coming swiftly. God will judge them. And the least we can do is to follow the advice of the Apostle Paul. Mark them and avoid them. So don't make excuses for them. Don't rationalize for them. Don't defend them. Judge them the way Scripture judges them. Now, very quickly then, the third mark of a false teaching and false teaching is this. They contradict, add to, or subtract from God's word. They add to, they subtract, and contradict God's word. I have written a book, dear friends. By the way, you can read a copy free of charge, if you log on to our website at www.reformedgospel.org, 
go to the books and resources section and you will download perhaps a PDF version or a Word version and you can read that. It is called The Disease Called God Told Me. It's a cancer that is ravaging the people of God within churches. It's a malignant cancer that is ever growing. Everybody has a word from the Lord. Everybody is saying, God told me. And what they are doing then in the process is to contradict, add to, or subtract from God's word. I have said before that whenever somebody tells me, God told me, the first thing I say to them before they proceed is, which chapter are you in and which verse are you looking at? Because God speaks to us in his word, in his infallible, inerrant, never to be questioned word. This has been tested seven times in the very heavens and been found true. Heaven and earth may pass away, says Jesus, but not even a jot of this word will pass away. The scripture cannot be broken. John chapter 10 verse 30 to 35. Jesus says the scriptures cannot be broken. They are true. The word of the Lord is perfect. David says in Psalm 19 verse 7, the word of the Lord is perfect. Anchor your life on God's word. But there are prophets today who come sometimes flatly contradicting God's word. For example, there is a prophet in this country, Kenya, who said John the Baptist appeared to him and John the Baptist actually shared with him the day of the return of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist shared with him. In fact, he described John the Baptist as a short, stout man, the bald head. I mean, a, a bald developing at the, the, the center of his head. He said, John told him that. Now, if you understood scripture, if you knew anything about what the Lord Jesus said, he said, no one knows the day nor the hour, not even the Son of Man himself. The day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. No one knows. So they contradict the scripture. Flat out contradict the scripture. Sometimes they don't contradict the scripture. Sometimes they add on to the scripture. For example, scripture says the sacred things belong to the Lord our God. And those things that have been revealed to us are ours and our children's children. We cannot pry. We cannot dig into that which scripture has not revealed to us. That is God's secret. Now we know Men like Benny Hinn who have come up with revelations, for example, and they said that they saw Jesus and that Jesus is nine foot tall and, and, and the descriptions that are so weird like that. We know we've seen people like Kenneth Copeland describe their meeting with Jesus. We know people like Jesse Duplantis who say they have been transported to heaven and have seen things there. Now remember Paul went to heaven, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1 and onwards. And he said, I saw things there. Or I know a man who went to the third heaven and saw things there that are not permitted for man to speak about. Yet these things, Jesse Duplantis speaks about them so freely. They add on to the scripture. Benny Hinn one time came with a theory. I think this was on Trinity Broadcasting Network, TBN show, when he was being interviewed by Jean Croch, the wife to the late uh, president of TBN, Paul Croch. And, and he said that it, in, in the beginning, when Adam was created, Adam had wings, like a bird, like an animal. Adam could fly to outer space. Where did you read that in the scripture? Nowhere. But Benny Hinn has that revelation. He said God's intent, in fact, women used to give birth through their sides, somewhere uh, through their sides, not through the birth canal. Where did you read that in scripture? Nowhere. But Benny Hinn has it. False prophets will contradict scripture or add on to scripture or subtract from scripture. Now Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 has the following words of advice for us. The following words which we must take very carefully. The messengers of darkness come to us in many forms, in many shapes, and in many uh, variations. Chapter 8 and verse 20 of Isaiah. Chapter 8 and verse 20. Isaiah uh, says to us, Consult God's instruction, verse 20, Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. Scripture. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light in them. If anyone does not speak 
according to this word, there's no light in them. They're not God's prophet at all. Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 14, again, the prophet warns us there very helpfully. Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 14. The Lord said to me, says the prophet, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their minds. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword of famine will touch this land. So he says, those same prophets will perish by the sword and famine. Verse 16, and the people they are prophesying to will be thrown out into the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. There will be no one to bury them. Their wives, their sons, and their daughters, I will pour out on them the calamity they deserve. I read something on a blog post, and I think this was Tim Chalice, a blogger. He said, no one or nothing takes people to hell in more numbers and in a faster rate than false prophets. They are filling their churches with men who love entertainment. They are filling their churches with men who love to be told positive things and never to be told the truth about their lives. People never want a pastor, they don't want a preacher who will tell them they doubt their salvation, that maybe they don't know the Lord. They think you're judgmental and do that. They want a prophet who will cuddle them, who will tell them nice things, who will tell them things that their itchy ears want to hear. What scripture says is, those prophets will die by the sword and famine, and the people will die by the sword and famine. To paraphrase the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, those blind men who lead the blind men, their fate is shared. You will not have a defense in heaven that your prophet lied to you, that your teacher lied to you, that your pastor lied to you. That will not be a defense. Wake up and trust the gospel. So, mark number four, the fourth sign, the fourth mark of false prophets and their false teaching is that it will bear bad fruit. Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, you shall know them by their fruit. They may put up a facade for some time. They may pretend for some time but not forever. He was right who said you can cheat some people sometime, but you cannot cheat all the people all the time. That adage holds true for false prophet, for those discerning minds, for those who are keen, for those who are looking for truth. There will be something that will betray them sooner or later. Bad fruit will always attend false prophet. A wolf will not hide its nature for long. They told me a story. I think it's folklore, really. Uh, but it's a nice story. They, 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 say, they say it to children. Say so there used to be a wolf who put on sheep's clothing and pretended to be part of the sheep. Behave like the sheep. Even try to bleat like a sheep. When the sheep went out to pasture, the wolf among them went out the sheep to pasture. When they went to the drinking streams, the wolf went together with the lambs, with the, with the sheep to, to the streams to drink. When they came home, the same happened. But here's the point, my friends. Sheep eat grass, wolves eat flesh. Sheep are herbivores, wolves are carnivores. That's the true nature of a sheep. I mean, of a wolf, sorry. So the wolf was pretending, but the hunger was getting the better of the wolf because it can't feed on grass. So one time as they were, had come out of pasture and have taken their drink, now they were in open space, relaxing. Sheep sleep like that. They relax like that. It's the nature of sheep. Wolves don't relax like that. 
will sit the way dogs sit, on their hind legs, and their front legs are raised like that. That's the way wolves and dogs uh, relax. And the sheep was surprised. Say, what's going on here? You're not standing like one of us. But then it wasn't a big deal. So they let it slide. Mark number one. But the hunger pans were growing in the wolf. Getting the better of him. Eventually a very big fly flew by. And the wolf could not hide its nature any longer. Flipped out its tongue to go for the fly. And in the process its deadly fangs were exposed. What's the moral of the story? A wolf might be in sheep's clothing, but they will be known by their fruit. Matthew 7, 18 to 20 tells us that. We will know them by their fruit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 5, Paul speaks about these things that will happen to those people in the latter days. They will be boisterous. They will, these are signs that you can look out for. Now, there are three things that you must always watch out for in the false teacher. I love to call them the three G's or the three F's, if you like. The gold, the girl, and the glory. Their fruit will show in these three arenas. The false prophet, the false teacher, he will love the gold. They love flashy lifestyles. Gold is everything to them. They live in, 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 in wonderful, expensive mansions and they brag about them. It's not enough for them that they have good cars they now fly private jets. They love the gold. They preach about offering and tithe every other time. Their message cannot be removed from tithing and offering. They fleece God's people. In the language of 2 Peter chapter 2, they make merchandise of God's people. They make profit out of God's people. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, from verse 8, 9, and 10, he says, look, these people think that godliness is a means of gain. They love the gold. They love the gold. Watch out for that pastor. Watch out for that preacher. Watch out for that minister. Watch out for that so-called apostle, the so-called prophet who is always for the gold. He glorifies the gold. He wants to speak about the gold all the time. He's a false prophet. No doubt. That's a sure sign. See, the Lord said, when you go to a city, do not take anything with you. That's what the Lord said. The Lord said, the poor you'll always have with you. That's what the Lord said. Paul said, in plenty and in want, I have learned to, 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 to suffice. I have learned to be content. This is the language of scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me is a verse that is preceded by verses where Paul says in suffering and in good, in, in, in worse times and in good times, I've learned to be a base. I mean, I've learned to be okay, content. But the false teacher will disparage poverty. He will disparage lack and want. They are those who don't speak about suffering. Suffering for them is always from the devil. When you hear that kind of theology, you're hearing a false teacher. Whether he knows it, or he doesn't know it. He's a false teacher. But the second G you've got to watch out for is the girl. The girl. Many false teachers, sooner or later, they fall into that trap. Not really fall into a trap because they love it. Their nature is immoral. Their nature has not been changed. What are they talking about? The scandals following Benny Hinn with uh, Paula White and his divorce and our remarriage to Suzanne and, and all that, whether you're talking about uh, Jimmy Swaggart and his uh, philandering ways, whether you're talking about Eddie Long and his homosexual tendencies, uh, Bishop Ed Long so-called, I, I mean, the, the, the list is endless. It can go on and on and on. What am I talking about? When there are relations to the opposite sex is too close. When they are the ministers who are served by special ladies, See, these are telltale signs. This idea that the servant of the Lord is to be massaged by the ladies like Kanyari. The other time, you, you remember on our television screens, 
Mr. Kanyarian and people like that, they are massaged, their feet are being washed by some women. You know, that, that kind of behavior is unfitting, is unbecoming of a servant of the Lord. Watch out for that preacher, for that prophet who has too close, inordinate relations with the girl. The gold, the girl. Lastly, the glory. The glory. They love the limelight. They like a big name. They want to make their mark. It was John Calvin, I'm told, whose tomb was unmarked up until today. Such a great theologian, such a preacher who influenced the thinking of Christianity, and arguably the greatest theologian after the biblical days. But such a man never wanted to be recognized. In the language of scriptures, we are men who are unprofitable. We are only servants sent to do something. We, we, we don't want to be recognized. We don't want to be welcomed by presidents and governors in cities. That, that's not our place. You remember that time when Paul and I think it's Barnabas were in Athens and a miracle happens and the people come and, and, and want to bow down to worship them. They rent their clothes and say, no, no, we are not gods. Today the preachers are opposite. They want to be worshipped. They want to be glorified. They want to be recognized. If you don't call them the servant of the Lord, the man of God, the prophet of God, the apostle of God, then you have actually erred. Here in Kenya we have a man that masquerades as a prophet. He moonlights as the latter day Old Testament prophet. His name is David Edward Uwar of the Holiness Movement. One time on television, he is holding what they call a miracle service. And one woman claiming to have cancer comes, and one of the other women wants to be healed. And Prophet David Ward says, uh, say your problem, says, pastor. And he says, I'm not a pastor. Oh, teacher, I'm not a teacher. And, and when, when that lady eventually said, mighty prophet of the Lord, David Ward said, because you have recognized me, let the cancer dry. They want to be recognized. That's what they put in the apostles. They want the glory. They want the fame. The question should be, is it Jesus or is it them? As they preach. This is something you can test. As they preach. Who is coming out more? Is it Christ or is it them? Is it their success? Or the word of God. What percentage of their preaching centers on them and their exploits and the things they do? What? You can judge that. The gold, the girl, the glory. You can also talk about the finance, the female, the femme. When they are too concerned about these things, you know that you're in the presence of a false prophet. Now the fifth sign that you're in the presence of a false prophet and false teaching is this. Men accept them and men speak well of them. That's one of the signs of a false teacher and a false prophet because it is a clear sign that they are not teaching God's word truthfully. When men speak well of them, when they are liked by people, people want them to speak more. People love the things that they do. They draw huge crowds, huge congregations. You can be sure that is a false teacher. Why am I saying so? Throughout scripture, look at the Old Testament prophets. What they loved, never. They were enemies of the state, pariahs in the nation. Joy, 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 joy extinguishers, kill joys. They could have been as well called then. Look at the apostles. What they loved, not by anybody. The 12 of them, the 11 died gruesome death, murdered. The 12th, John, the writer of the book of Revelation, he died at an old age, but after immense persecution and suffering. The Christian faith has never been loved by people. One of the signs I know you're a false prophet is when people love you, when they, he praises on you then I know that you're not a true teacher of God's word. You are an entertainer. 
You're a performer. You're a man pleaser. Luke chapter 6 and verse 26. Luke chapter 6 and verse 26. This again, uh, the words, Luke chapter 6 and verse 26. The words of our Lord. War to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. What to you when men speak well of you? That's exactly how they treated their ancestors, treated the false prophets. Give them good food. Give them good offering. Give them cars. They feel like they want to bless you because you've entertained them. You've made them feel happy. You've not offended them. You've not brought God's truth, which is like a sword. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of the Lord is a double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, bone and marrow, thoughts and intents, laying bare the thoughts of men, convicting them, bringing them to grips with their sinfulness and pointing them to the Savior. That is not a task for the false prophet. He can't do that. He won't have the crowds. The numbers will not come. See, that's what... 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, beloved. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Again, Paul here has words that should be very, very serious uh, for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. On the contrary, Paul says, we are not men pleasers. We don't en entertain them. No, we don't. On the contrary, as opposed to the false prophet, this is what a true prophet will do. This is what the man of God will do. This is what a true teacher will do. This is what a genuine pastor will do. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. We are not trying to please people. We are only trying to please God. That's what our interest is all about. Not any other. Now, the sixth mark very quickly, of a false prophet. They hate doctrine. They hate doctrine and they thrive on the trivial. They hate doctrine. Doctrine is taxing to the minds of the people. The false prophet doesn't like that. It won't bring in the crowds. They rather labor, they, they labor the trivial. They, they want the light things. God will bless you. God will give you that. God will make you good. Your life will be. But they don't want to engage the minds of the people to in proper teaching of God's word. They hate doctrine. If you see a man who hates doctrine, doesn't teach God's word, line upon line, precept upon precept, my friends, you are in dangerous place. Number seven, false prophets major in stories Rhyme and rhetoric. Stories, rhyme and rhetoric. In other words, they love flowery speeches. They major on rhetoric. They are big on entertainment. They are big on 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 on, on flowery speech. Silver tongue. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 to verse 17. Paul has warnings there about deceit and philosophies of men. See, again, 2 uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Again, we are warned there. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. We are warned there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. We have warnings there. Discover to recover. Some of their rhymes will go like that. Aspire before you expire. Words that tickle the mind, tickle the ears. They are flowery speeches. 
They have no plain statement of truth. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, Brethren, I came to you, I did not come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but the demonstration of the Spirit and power. They clothe their words that way. But we depend on the Spirit. I want to leave you, dear friends, with a quote from Tim Charlie's, a blogger. And this is what Tim Charlie says. And these are the words I leave you with in terms of reinforcing that seventh mark of a false prophet. Stories, rhymes, rhetoric. They love flowery speech. They have a silver tongue. This is what Tim Charlie says, all right, and I quote, Just as a prostitute paints and perfumes herself to appear more attractive and more alluring, the false teacher hides his blasphemous and dangerous doctrine behind powerful arguments and eloquent use of language. These are messengers of darkness, and we must watch out for them. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get more notifications, because the next message I will be speaking about the message of darkness and in a sense all the four parts have been bringing us to this point because I want to investigate from now forward those massive movements that have rocked Christianity and that have brought us to where we are today. So subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking that subscribe button and then we will bring you notifications. You can also log on to our website at www.reformedgospel.org All one word, www.reformedgospel.org Until the next time, my dear friends, until the harvest is in and the barns are all full, to the glory of the Lord God our Savior, it's bye-bye from me now. May the Lord be with you. And watch out for the messengers of darkness. Bye-bye.